Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We are going to be live today in three different trials across the country. We have a lot to cover, a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Now, first up, we're coming to the conclusion of the Charles Merritt case out of California, the man accused of killing an entire family, the McStays. We began this case all the way back in January with opening statements, and we're finally coming to the final arguments of the prosecution today. As soon as that starts up at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to let you know. Now, I'm also keeping a very careful eye on the courtroom feed out of South Carolina because we're waiting to jump live in the Timothy Jones Jr. case. This is the father accused of killing his five children. The defense is arguing insanity. We have seen uh, testimony over the past few days from people that knew him and the kids very well. We even heard from this man's father yesterday. We're going to have an opportunity to break down this case a little bit later on. And as soon as that goes live, we will go live. Right now, though, we're focusing on the trial of Kellen Winslow II, that former NFL star who has now been accused by five women of being a sexual predator. He's accused of raping three women, uh, kidnapping one of them, exposing himself to a fourth, and masturbating in the presence of a fifth. And that's what brings us now to the testimony of Jane Doe number five. So this is that 77-year-old woman who claims the defendant exposed himself and masturbated in front of her at a, at a gym, at a spa. And now I want to talk about this because she had an opportunity to testify yesterday. And if you haven't seen it, let's play for you now. Oh boy. All right. A lot to talk about. And joining me, I have a full house right now. Back with me is criminal defense attorney Ashley McMahon. I'm also joined by criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon and of course law and crime legal analyst Jonna Spilbor. Welcome back everybody. I'm Thank glad you. to have everybody here. Jonna, I want to start with you. You know, sometimes we say, Jonna, it's just so out of this world, so outrageous. It's got to be true. Is that the flavor you're getting from Jane Doe number five? Oh, you know, I have my criminal defense attorney hat on this morning, and really what I'm thinking is, how can she be so sure? Is this going to be a situation where she thinks she saw something that was nefarious and lewd and rude? Um, you know, why didn't she race right away, get away from the defendant here and go report this? I know she's claiming, well, I didn't want anybody to know, but you don't have to stick around, Jesse. You can beat feet and get out of there. So I'm still being a, a little skeptical about her testimony. Michael, let me ask you this. A strategy of having all these women testify in a relatively short amount of time, uh, not sometimes day after the day after each witness was testifying, and here yesterday you had Jane Doe number four and five testify. What impact does that have on a jury hearing all these five women in a relatively short amount of time? I think in large part, you know, this is a very emotionally charged case. And when you have so many different um, victims coming forward in such a short amount of time, it can be a little bit overwhelming almost. Um, and I think that's good for the prosecution. It does hurt the defense because it's that much more evidence to attack, to try to pull apart. Um, and at a certain point for them, it becomes very hard to try to not just differentiate the different crimes, but the different victims. And the jurors are just going to start taking it all at face value, I think just in terms of the amount of overwhelming evidence that they're going to have to deal with against the defense. And that's what we're waiting for, because the defense is going to begin their case today. We believe the prosecution is going to rest up on theirs. But, uh, you know, Ashley, I'm going to get your perspective in a minute on Jane Doe number five. I just want to play more of her testimony from yesterday in case our viewers missed it. Watch. So, Ashley, let's start with you. Uh, you know, Jonna spoke about some identification problems. You know, listening to how this happened and or allegedly happened in this hot tub, not to get too graphic, but maybe there's a way that she couldn't really see what was happening. Your thoughts? I agree with that completely. I mean, she's just admitted that not only was this occurring under the water, uh, the jets were on, and she's not even making eye contact or looking at the defendant. So uh, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the defense is going to go after the fact that she may not really know what she saw in this case. But just like Michael Bixon said, you know, uh, there's a cumulative effect here for the jury uh, when they see so many different Jane Doe's coming forward. They're going to look at that and see all of the alleged victims as a whole and think, oh, you know, well, if we believe one of the particular victims, uh, maybe we have to believe all of them. I don't think Jane Doe number five's case is very strong standing on its own. That would be a danger, though, right? I mean, Jonna, isn't that the danger that you want a jury to look at each case separately, each, each incident separately, and say, well, do we believe Jane Doe one? Do we believe Jane Doe two? Do we believe Jane Doe three, four, five? 
uh, because what is the defense going to do when they ultimately handed the case? I mean, how do they separate and say, jury, you have to understand each one of these incidents and each one of them can be explained away. What is the defense supposed to do here? That's been the overarching problem with the way this case is being brought to trial from the beginning, Jesse. I mean, you're not supposed to to glom all these cases together so that a jury says, well, so many women came forward that he must be guilty of something because this is not really, in my opinion, pattern evidence, which would allow you to kind of bring all these cases in under one umbrella. I mean, you've got some women who are middle-aged who his defense is consensual sex. Then you've got some a woman who's elderly and there was no sex at all, but he, in my opinion, was could have been scratching his thigh in a hot tub for crying out loud. I mean, so there, there are not a whole lot of similarities here, here. And if he is convicted on any of these offenses, you can bet the fact that these, these cases weren't severed will be one ground for appeal. Now, you did mention something, Michael, I want to touch upon it, the idea of what's allowed into this trial. Obviously, we got these five different uh, situations, but there's a number of acts and incidents that are not allowed at trial unless, of course, the defense brings them in themselves. They open the door for it. And you got everything from uh, prosecutors alleging that Winslow uh, you mean it un walked into a uh, women's locker room and shower area at a gym, at two gyms um, in 2018. There are these uh, burglary ch uh, incidents that, you know, with intent to rape. And also that in January of 2019, pros prosecutors alleged that Winslow stopped to talk to an 18-year-old who was walking home from school, and he told her that he thought she was cute, and asked for her phone number, how old she was, where she lived. She didn't give him the information. But these are some serious incidents and things that I think the jury should consider. So if we're talking about pattern evidence, how come this wasn't let in? I think the main reason why these uh, issues and these different cases weren't let in was just lack of evidence. And it's not like, again, Winslow doesn't have enough to deal with in this case. Um, I think, as was just mentioned, the fact that you have so many different types of incidents, so many different types of charges and victims all together already in one trial, I honestly think is a little absurd. I think they should have been separate trials. If anything, maybe victims one and two in the same trial, but the other ones were definitely different. I think that they should have been separated. Um, you know, as far as the evidence that wasn't let in, you know, I think it wasn't let in for a reason. I think that they already, like I said, they'll have enough to deal with as it is. I also wonder if it's a situation of a judicial economy and resources and money, if we just put all of them together as opposed to, you know, just separating them out, it could have cost more money, and that's more of a practical point of view. And welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. Before we get into our other major cases that we're covering here on the network, I have to sign off our very special guest who joined us this morning, criminal defense attorney Ashley McMahon. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your insight as always. Thank you, Jesse. Always a pleasure. All right. Now, we are going to get back to our big trial that we're waiting to jump live in any second. And of course, I'm talking about the Timothy Jones Jr. case. This is the father who's accused of killing his five children ages one through eight, then putting their bodies in his car, driving around the southeast, and ultimately burying them in rural Alabama. The defense is arguing insanity that he suffered from schizophrenia. He has a traumatic brain injury. We've been hearing testimony from experts and medical professionals, but we've also heard testimony from people that knew the defendant very well, and we heard a lot of that yesterday. Let's go right now to Jody Durney, who was the former babysitter of these kids. If you haven't heard what she had to say, this is pretty enlightening. Watch. Jonna, let's start with you. As we're watching this, I'm not sure what the strategy is here. There, you have a witness who, who's called by the defense that says he was a great father, but the defense has conceded that this man killed his kids. What are we going with here? What's going? What's happening? I'm so glad you said that, Jesse, because I was scratching my head for a minute and checking my notes to make sure that that was a defense witness. Um, because, yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. When you put forth an insanity defense, the fact that she's basically testifying that he was a great dad, um, does that lend itself to the insanity defense? I suppose if you're going to claim that he was schizophrenic, which is part of the defense, maybe she's describing his, uh, quote, normal personality and therefore the the horrible personality took over and and that's why you know we should find him not guilty by reason of insanity i think it's a little confusing and i'm sure the jury's going to think it's confusing too michael is another aspect of this that perhaps he was living a normal life and had a well a semi-normal life and he had a psychotic episode a break from reality emphasis on that break there and showing that he would never have harmed his kids otherwise 
That's possible, certainly. I, you know, I, I do think that this uh, witness is certainly going to be confusing for the jurors, like was just previously mentioned. The ultimate question here is whether or not he can distinguish or whether or not at the time of the murder he could distinguish right from wrong. Uh, this does not help to clarify that, right? Um, more than anything, I, I think like what was just mentioned, it is confusing for the jurors. It, it doesn't really help his case as much. If you want to present something that sort of shows the two sides of, um, you know, maybe his personality, maybe this could go towards that positive aspect of it. But I don't think in the long run it's going to help so much. You talk about confusing. I mean, let's confuse things up a little bit more. We heard the testimony from Crystal Ballantyne, who was the defendant's ex-girlfriend, um, does this clarify the issue? I don't think so. If you haven't seen it, let's play some of her testimony from yesterday. Okay. Now, Jana, she's talking about first that he is talking to himself, but says not really uncommon. Basically, people talk to themselves. And what we just watched was the cross-examination of this witness. But again, this was a defense witness. So she talks about him talking to himself, but says it really wasn't a sign of insanity. She didn't see him being insane at any point. And she talks about seeing and hearing him beat the children. How yeah. is this an effective defense witness? So let me go off on a little tangent here, because what really doesn't make sense to me as an attorney and a human being is if you're in a relationship with somebody who you routinely hear beating their children, and in her words, hard, and you don't do anything about it, then she should be on trial too. That's my two cents on that. Second, how is she helping the defense? Because I want. Can I just read you one sentence from the statute here, Jesse? John, you can do. You can do whatever you want. This is your. This is your moment. Not my show, but all right. But listen, under the South Carolina law, it says here under the statute for the uh, mental insanity, evidence of a mental disease or defect that is manifested only by repeated criminal or other antisocial conduct is not sufficient to establish the defense of insanity. What's she describing? She's describing criminal conduct. She's describing antisocial conduct. She should be a witness for the prosecution right now, as far as I'm concerned. Michael, what are your thoughts? I mean, is there something we're missing here? So I think on one hand, she's obviously demonstrating that he's abusive, that he's aggressive. The ultimate question is what's causing those behaviors? Is it just because he's a bad person or is it because he's actually criminally insane as the statute defines? I think in one way, if you look at it in terms of the prosecution's argument, you know, this is gonna to go towards this repeated um, abusive behavior that's not caused by schizophrenia or any other type of mental defect. This is just because he's a bad person, it has nothing to do with his mental state. For the, pros, uh, for the defense attorneys, they're gonna to have to do a much better job of eliciting that this was actually caused by, you know, was it the voices in his head? Was it caused by his schizophrenia or other type of mental condition? Um, so I think they need, need to do a little bit better job of actually eliciting that from the witnesses. Yeah, well, I, I am curious to, to see what the, the strategy is here because I, I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to tie it all together in closing arguments. Uh, John, one real quick question. You had mentioned the statute. It's much tougher getting insanity uh, than it is uh, in South Carolina than it might be in any other state. Am I correct in understanding that? It's pretty tough everywhere, Jesse. And uh, when I was doing a little bit of research about somebody we might talk about a little later, uh, Andrea Yates, the insanity defense is only brought up in 1% of the cases in the country, and it's only successful in a quarter of those. So sure. that's a really small margin, no matter how you slice it or what state you're and, in. And usually you have these like three different levels to get insanity in most states, and South Carolina just it really gives you one, kind, well, two kind of options. To You have to have a mental disease or defect, but then once you get there, the only way that you can get insanity is if the person didn't know from right or wrong. Usually you get this second prong that says you can't, even if you knew right from wrong, you couldn't conform your behavior to the law. Here they split it and say, well, no, the only way you can be insane is if you didn't know right from wrong. But if you knew right from wrong, but couldn't conform your behavior to the law, you could be found guilty, but mentally ill, which basically means you go to prison and you get mental health treatment. Very different South Carolina law. We're gonna have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit later on. I am getting word that a new witness is on the stand in Timothy Jones. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back.